are listening to Bearcat Insider with everybody's favorite assistant coach, Travis Marsh, and I'm Chance Kirby. Now to the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bearcat Insider. Uh, I'm here with uh, everybody's favorite real estate broker, Pilot Point's favorite son, Chance <laughs> Kirby. <laughs> Hello. And uh, head football coach, Kyle Peacock, and uh, the new guy on the block, Bo Burris, who's the uh, defensive coordinator of the Bearcats. Um, let's get started just talking scrimmage. Okay, we scrimmaged uh, Van Alstine here at, uh, at our place uh, last Friday. Coach Peacock, we'll start with you. Just general overall impressions of the, uh, of the scrimmage. Yeah, you know, I mean, in the first scrimmage every year, you know, you tell the kids going into it, you know, we know there's going to be mistakes. But what we ask of you in the first scrimmage, you know, we want you to play full speed. And the mistakes you do make, we want you to make those going full speed ahead. And, you know, control your effort. You know, everything else, you know, we can coach you on where to be and when to be there and all that stuff. But the effort's got to come from you. And that's one of the things, you know, we came out in the scrimmage. And, you know, I thought the kids did a really great job. You know, they come out, you know, we're thinning our numbers this year. So we're asking a lot of kids to do a lot of different things, play a lot of positions. And, and you know, we came out, you know, offensively. We moved the ball down the field, you know, on Van Austin, Executed. We ended up scoring. You know, we had a couple deep balls get caught. Quarterback, you know, made some good reads. Gage Anderson ran the ball well inside. Offensive line had good movement up front, you know, so it showed us that, you know, through the first week, two weeks of football, you know, the kids have really, you know, they've gathered what we're doing. So they understand the assignments. But where I think where we got a little bit of a hang up was our conditioning, you know, again, because we're asking basically when you go to a scrimmage like that, you've got a set of your ones and you bring your set of your twos in. Well, right now, our twos are really just a remixture of our ones. I mean, we're asking kids to go do different things and play different positions because, again, just depth runs into you run into a depth issue there. So, again, you know, we're, you know, to whereas Van also, you know, they've got a first team and a second team. And again, they're a big school. And, and that's why we like to scrimmage people like that, to put our kids in those situations to see how they're going to respond. But, you know, they did great. You know, they, again, they made some mistakes, but the mistakes they did make were simple, easy mistakes to fix. They were going full speed. You know, and I was proud of them. I mean, we showed some conditioning late in the scrimmage. You know, we kind of got to where, you know, where our kids, they, their bodies weren't letting them go full speed anymore. They started making a couple mental mistakes. But, you know, that's conditioning. And that's something we can fix as a staff. And that's what we told them. You know, that's – the, the part where you started making mistakes, guys, that's the balls in our court as coaches because we can fix the conditioning part. Well, and this is where the, the Bearcat insider part comes in of, uh, you know, I was here for the, the worst practice of your young head coaching career mm-hmm. on the, the, what was it, the Wednesday? Yes, sir. Before? It was, yep. Um, how, how did you feel after that practice on Wednesday going into the first real competition? Man, it's, it's, you know, uh, you know, being coming from the offensive side of the ball, you know, you want that last practice before you go out to a competition to be crisp. You know, the route running's precise. The ball doesn't hit the grain. You know, there used to be an old saying that GA used to say, we could, we should bring out a new football the day before a game and not even have a mark on it when we get done. Yeah. You know, and that just wasn't the case. You know, we were dropping passes. We were busting routes. And you could just tell the kids. We actually ended up sh- just shutting practice off, you know, and I told the kids, hey, you know, we're, it's, we're, we're snowballing right now. And, you know, I think that the more we keep this up, the worse it's going to get. So, you know, we, we just called it. We said, guys, you're making mistakes. You're tired mentally. You're not there. So we don't, we don't need to practice making mistakes. You know, we don't have to practice to do that. So, again, we called it. We told them, hey, we're going to come out here fresh tomorrow, and we're going to start on a new leg. And, you know, they rebounded okay. Again, I wasn't unimpressed with them. But, again, just that's part of, you know, the maturity of your team. Can you prepare yourself for a competition? You know, that just – and that's a growing process. That's something with our young kids. We're putting them into those positions to do that, that they've never had to do that before. Again, so, being ahead. the voice of the people. Yes, sir. And I apologize. You're going to get the first time to get stupid questions from me that Travis has to deal with literally every week. Oh, shoot. So – Speaking to the public that walked away from that uh-huh. in a complete panic, yeah, you're just saying, "Hey guys, it's we ran out of gas. Two weeks from now, we're going to be two weeks more conditioned than we are now." Absolutely, and and I and I told you know I was talking to somebody after the game, and they said, well, "How do you feel?" I said, that, "That was the tale of two teams right there. I mean, you take the team that rolled out there at the beginning. We moved the ball all the way down the field, offensively, defensively. Van Austin couldn't move the football at all. I mean, we were stoning them at the line of scrimmage. Our kids were flying around." And, you know, they were there. That means they know their assignments. They know what they're doing, okay, and because they're fresh. And when you start getting conditioned and you're getting tired and you can't, your, your body's not letting you think and react fast enough, that's when you start making mistakes. Where I was, you know, where our Jack, and I'll let Coach Burris jump in a second, where our Jack was fitting at the line of scrimmage, making that play for a one-yard gain, now his thought process has got him being there, and that guy's already at plus five. 
So now, and then we start missing tackles. I mean, little things become huge things and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was, I mean, again, did they make mistakes? Yes. And it showed big time when we got into the live quarter. But a lot of it was just based around what kind of shape we're in and what we're asking these kids to do. Well, and it goes back to one of our favorite sayings is uh, fatigue makes a coward of us all. Yep. I know that's one of your favorites. I've heard that a bunch. Let's start piling up the cliches. Now, uh, Coach Burris. Yes, sir. We'll get to more about you here in a second, but just what are your what are your takeaways from Van Alstine scrimmage? Well, I agree with Kyle. Um, I I really liked uh, the way we came out and performed with what we have put in against the type of offense that they were running, and uh, you don't see a, uh, an offense run that high paced in a scrimmage usually. Um, there's a lot of teaching going on. There's a lot of bodies moving around and personneling and things like that and Van Alstine their motive is going to go fast this year you could tell by a scrimmage they were ripping their 12th play set off their 10 play set off in you know less than 10 minutes it was boom 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 and usually the first time a defense that I've coached sees a hurry up offense that quick you got D linemen standing up people aren't getting the call it looks like panic you know they have to see it in that live phase and we didn't blink um and so that was that was exciting for me uh to see that we haven't been doing this very long and they're already to that point and that tells me the foundation of what they're doing they're comfortable mentally and physically in and then as the scrimmage went on all of a sudden our fits weren't as crisp and as clean all of a sudden uh the b gap that was clogged up was no longer clogged because we were getting pushed in places where we hadn't get gotten pushed before and so that's on us and that's on the kids to get in the type of shape where we can be uh that clean as the first 22 plays were during the set regardless of what the situation is how fast they're going um how many people deep they are whatever we're bearcats and uh you know this is who we're going to be down in and down out i felt like walking away mental shape just like physical shape, that's what I was saying about the defense. Mentally, this is the first time they've ever ran it. In right. theory, they will get a grasp of it more and more in live action every week to where that's just going to improve simply by learning how to, how to run it. Yes, sir. And uh, to, go to, to go to Kyle's point about uh, how we're going to attack the problem of depth, um, because we're one deep or two deep in certain positions, they don't see – as big or as live of a look as what they saw the other day. And so it really plays into scrimmages are a practice. Like that was our practice against a big live look that we may not get to see every day with how we scout and things like that. Now they got a taste for it, okay? Now they know the expectation. Now they know how it's gonna fit when it's live. And uh, I expect us to make a jump into the second scrimmage. Well, and to, to your credit, um, one of my coworkers at the middle school, he, uh, he was able to watch the film on uh, Van Alstine's huddle, actually, and uh, he, he was very impressed in that first set of plays how it seemed like there was running room, and then all of a sudden, you know, a Bearcat would make a hit, and then he would make a hit, and another hit, and it was just, he said that we were hustling to the ball and flying to the ball, and that's kind of uh, a calling card of your style of defense, isn't it? We expect that. Um that's that's where we start is we're going to run to the ball um and when we rep in practice it's not about doing pursuit drill and hustling just to hustle it's something that we rip every time we're out there somebody's standing and watching there should be a coach yelling you know get them to the ball it's got to be instinct for them and in that first set uh ball popped out a couple times okay and because it's a set scrimmage and whatever we just replayed the down and went on um but in the game that's a big deal and uh, all of a sudden, part of your defense getting off the field, and now you're not getting as gassed as quick, okay? Turnovers, uh, you know, some people think are the metric to a certain degree um, in the faster, higher-paced offense where possessions are what matter. Um, and so being able to create those, uh, especially early in a game, can be a big momentum swing and can, you know, keep you fresher later. Okay, and then uh, for, for the public out there, we're talking to Coach Burris. Um, this is your first time on the podcast, and so we're going to go yes, through uh, introducing Bo Burris to 
the, the Bearcat people out there, the Bearcat Nation, uh, as people like to call it. So um, we're going to start from the absolute top. Where where'd you go to high school? Where'd you grow up? So I'm born and raised in Oklahoma City. Don't hold it against me that I'm north of the red. Uh, I grew up on the south side near the suburb of Moore. You probably see it on the news every now and then because a big one comes through, a little F5 action. I went to Westmore High School. Um, very proud of where I went. It's got a pretty good football tradition as far as Oklahoma football goes. Um, asterisk. But uh, I was part of a, a semifinalist team uh, that knocked off six time state champion Jinx. That's uh, the only one I've ever heard of in Oklahoma. Okay, there you go. Um, so we were, we were proud of what we accomplished. We didn't quite get to where we needed to, but uh, had a heck of a run and had a lot of fun doing it. Okay, and then uh, when you left high school, you came much closer to us. Yes. You were a, how many year letterman? Four year letterman. Four year letterman, yes, sir. At uh, UNT. Yes, sir. Mean Green. You've taught us all the proper claw technique. That's right. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. And so uh, tell us a little bit about your, your college experience. And uh, So I was a, I would, without fluffing myself here, I was a pretty good high school football player I was talented I had size and stuff like that and then I got my face pushed in the dirt the first couple years at UNT all of a sudden everybody was the best player at their high school Um, I'm an 18 year old 19 year old kid playing against 23 year old men Uh, and uh, it really prepared me for this part of the profession all of a sudden just being taller faster whatever wasn't enough everybody's tall and fast and so learning how to be a technician, learning how important film is, all that, gaining 60 pounds, all right, like training your body, all these different things uh, kind of put me in the place to be able to teach those things, even to a kid that you know relies on talent and yeah. express how important some of these things are and work ethic and things like that. Um, I developed into an okay college player. I was... Uh, a guy that was going to be where they needed to be, be in his gap, uh, take whatever came to me, but I was not a splash player. And so it was everything I had all the time just to stay on the field. I was always looking over my shoulder as somebody better got recruited and whatever and fighting my butt off to stay on the field week in and week out. In the defensive end, is that correct? Yes, sir. We, we didn't. So we were a 3-4 uh, for one year, so I'd call myself a DT at that point. But most of the time, we were an even front, and I was a five or a nine. Okay. And then uh, Daryl Dickey was the head coach for the first three years? Four years. First so four I redshirted years. Okay. and then lettered four years. And so through my junior year, Daryl Dickey was my uh, head coach, and I'm proud of my time with him. We won two conference championships, went to two bowl games. Um, had a lot of outstanding players that I got to be around and uh, share a brotherhood with. And then uh, we didn't do good enough and we didn't play well enough in 2006 and that staff got fired. And so I was part of the regime change when uh, the Todd Dodge experiment had started. Yeah. And uh, I think history speaks for itself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. W- without, he's an excellent high school Very good. Coach. One of the best. Um, and so uh, – how did your college experience parlay into your coaching career, and how did you kind of start with your coaching career? Right. So um, with the Dickey staff spreading out over the nation, if y'all don't know how college football works, when the head guy gets fired, it's like, you know, a cherry bomb in the anthill. They go everywhere, wherever they can get a job. And so I lost a lot of my network here in Texas uh, when that happened. When Dodge came in, it was an all-new staff, and uh, – to a certain degree, after the season, you know, they were ready to start coaching the guys they recruited. And so I didn't have as much assistance uh, getting into this profession as uh, what one may expect. That was paired with uh, the recession hitting in 08. Yeah. And the state announcing the budget was going to be cut by $3 billion and they were reducing jobs and stuff. And so. I did not end up with a coaching job until the fall of 2009, way down in a little town called Beeville, Texas. Um, It's an hour and a half south of San Antonio and 40 minutes north of Corpus. Okay. And then Beeville was the start. Yes, sir. What what were the steps that got you to Pilot Point High School? Okay. So I go from Beeville for two years. I 
my experience there was, uh, man, it was a growing experience just in my football knowledge because everybody down there is running something called the slot T mm-hmm. where there's 11 hats inside the hashes. You'll, and, you'll uh, see it week, week three. Yeah, yeah. It'll be um, yeah. an exciting test for me. I do have some experience with it, so um, I look forward to the challenge. Um, but I grew a lot as a coach. I found my coaching voice. Um, I went from, I was coaching D-line there. I went from there to a big school in the Cy Fair district outside of Houston called Jersey Village, 3,800 kids. Uh, Cy Fair had at that time 10 6A schools and we all played each other. You were playing one non-conference and then, or one non-district and then you were fighting for your playoff life. Yeah. Um, and loved it there, loved it there. Would have stayed there a long time if uh, the downfall of all great men hadn't happened. I met a woman. And uh, <laughs> uh, who is now my wife, a Katie girl, and uh, we got we got serious, and she got a job up in the DFW, and so I started searching jobs uh, up here, which landed me at Richland High School um, in Birdville ISD over on the northeast side of 820, and uh, loved it there. I coached D line there, I coached safeties there, and I coached corners here there in three successive years. Um, I'd like to thank Jed Cates, who's the head coach there still, for trusting me to be an old D line coach and transition to the back end because he knew it was going to be important for my growth towards being a DC, okay, coaching everything. And uh, we had our first child, and mama said, You need to get closer to home. I live in Prosper, and so the drive 47 miles to Richland was a little bit much with not knowing what we didn't know about having a child. So I went to uh, Hebron High School and uh, got to coach under the legend Brian Brazel. And uh, that was a great experience, a lot of talent there. I coached corners one year and I coached D-line one year. So both sides of the defense, they run the KD 3-4 and I got a lot of knowledge on that. And uh, Coach Cates thought I did a good enough job that when he lost the D.C. uh, there at Richland to go be a head coach, he called me back to be the D.C. We then knew what we knew about having one child, and Mama signed off on it. And so I went and got my uh, three years of D.C. experience there. And then I had the second child, and I needed to get closer to home. Okay. Uh, Loved my time there at Richland. I could have spent the rest of my career there, but uh, my family is the most important thing to me and uh once again it was time to get closer to home and uh when i came and interviewed with uh coach peacock this felt like the right place it felt like a special place and it felt like a place that i'd want my kids to be around and uh that i would be proud to tie to my family and it felt like home well, and, and family is huge. Uh, it's a huge part of what we do because it almost feels like your your wife allows you, yeah, in in a certain sense. I mean, yeah, you know. But uh, so back closer to home, um, I want you to talk a little bit about your Katie girl, as you called. Tell us a little bit about Rachel and your your two uh, children. So Rachel, uh, she um, is a corporate financial planner. Uh, she works in the JCP Corporation. She's the money. She's the brains. She's the heart and the soul of our little family. And uh, she was an athlete. She was a letterman in volleyball at AM Commerce. Um, and uh, basically is, you know, the driving force of what I'm able to do. Um, to take it deeper into my family, um, her parents are coaches. My parents are coaches, um, so she understands this profession. It doesn't mean she doesn't feel like uh, a coaching widow at times (laughs) or a single coaching mom, you know, type of deal, Uh, because everybody in this profession, as you said, knows how much of the weight that they pull and how special they are. And I'll I'll dip into cliches. They say there's uh, two types of coaching wives in Texas, great ones and exes. All right, so uh, she's on the great one side, uh, and I'm I'm proud to call her my own. Then uh, now we have introduced one Burris into PPISD. Uh, yes, Bear started kindergarten. <laughs> he he did. He's in uh, Miss Gorman's class with uh, one of the Peacock boys. That's Boss is in there. Yeah, poor Miss Gorman. Yeah, Golly. we're we're keeping her in our prayers. 
And then uh, how far away are we from uh, another Burris in, in PPISD? Here? So Braley, my daughter, she just turned one. So she's a couple years out, but she is rocking orange and black bows already. That's, that's all that we need to know. Now, Coach Peacock, whenever you know we, we start going through the process of, of hiring a new defensive coordinator, and you know there's a lot of stuff that goes into it that we don't want to bog down everybody with. But when you when you get down to decision time, and, and you're about to entrust the the scoreboard to this man yep. sitting here, what what was kind of the deciding factor there? You know, it it started. You know, getting once once we posted the job. You know, I think I look back and I met with Coach David. And I think the first week we had almost 60 resumes that got sent in. And, you know, being a new guy in my role, I'm just I'm shuffling and I'm reading. And when you're reading someone's resume, you're reading the best representation of them. So, I mean, you start having to look into their backgrounds and where they've been and what are their beliefs. And, you know, you we came across Coach Burst. And I actually remember taking his and setting it aside because I, I looked at it and I said, this guy's a 5A defensive corner. What in the world is he wanting to come to Pilot Point for? Yeah. So, of course, always you're like, well, what's the catch? I mean, what is it? So, I remember I set it aside, and then we kept going. Anyway, I got Keith, and I showed Keith. So, Coach David, I said, hey, let's. So, I separated a stack, and, of course, Coach, Coach Burris' name was in the stack. And we're going through them together, and we're looking. And, you know, I, it was one of those deals, me being new in my in my role. You know, of course, again, Coach David, having him there is, is so huge just to be able to go lean on him and say, hey, man, what do I – tell me something to look for. Help me out with, you know, because, again, it's my, my first time. You know, I don't know what I don't know yet. So anyway, we go to Coach Burris, and I'm reading, and I start looking, and I'm looking at the places he's been, the things he's coached. I mean, he's been on all different aspects of a defense. Yeah. He's coached different defensive, you know, fronts and coverages and back end. And then I'm like, so this guy's already a coordinator. He's applying for our coordinator position. So I got, well, I got to call the guy just to, I mean, I need to know, just for my own sake, I got to know what in the world are you sending your stuff into PowerPoint for? So anyway, I call him. We have a conversation on the phone, and I think he was at a track meet actually, because he's a track guy. I'm an old head track guy, so yes, sir. and I can hear him coaching on the phone, and he's talking, and then he's coaching. And I said, like, "Man, don't, hey, let me let you go, brother. Like I know you're busy coach. I mean, I'm a track coach too. I'm sorry I bothered you." And he, anyway, but he did. He go and he goes, "No, call you back as soon as." I, anyway, he called me back, and we talked about. It. So we set up a time for him to come in, and it's it's funny. Uh, I was waiting for him, and I mean, I think we just come out of a workout or something. So I'm, I'm still in like my coaching clothes. And I'm sitting at my desk, and of course, you always again we teach our kids something we teach our kids too. Like if you're supposed to be somewhere at nine o'clock, don't come walking here at nine o one. Don't come walking at nine o five. Absolutely not. Like if you're on time, you're late. And I remember it was like 15 minutes early, and I'm still like I got time to go change. Well, I don't. So all of a sudden, I hear someone walking. I hear Coach David say, "How are you?" And I peek around the corner, and there's a monstrosity of a human being standing in our coaching office in a coat and tie, and he can barely fit in the doorway. And I'm looking like – so he shakes Coach David's hand, and he goes over and shakes mine. He cracked every knuckle in my hand. I remember this because I'm pretty proud of my handshake. I've, I was, I've worked on that a long time. So he shook my hand. Of course, every – so I felt like a little kid. He cracked every knuckle. So anyway, we sat down, and we started going through it. You know, who, tell me about Coach Burris, you know, and I'm, tell, I'm kind of telling him about Pilot Point, what all Pilot Point has to offer and, and how this is a big family. I mean, it's a town, but it's more than a town. It's everybody in the same boat here, you know. I mean, again, you can't go eat. And I was I'm just basically telling him everything there is to know just because that's not for everybody. I mean, some, you know, some people, hey, man, I want to go have dinner without little Pilot Point kids running around saying hi to me. And, again, that's fine, but I'm just – I'm basically front-loading him with, hey, this is what you're stepping into. Yeah. And then he started talking to me about his family, you know, and places that he wanted his kids to go and everything. And we talked about the little shuttle bus that brings kids to practice and just how special that is. And, uh, you know, I remember talking to him, and then I, I had to ask him the big question, the one I was building up to. Is like, what in the – okay, what, why are you here? What do you want to come here for? I mean, you've already got a 5A job. You know, I was a 5A offensive coordinator at one time, so I understand the step back. You know, I came home because Powell Point was my home. You know, that's why I'm back here. You know, like – in his situation, like, I've got to know the answer. And it was for my family. You know, and, again, we always talk in football, you know, family's, family's number one. I mean, again, football's a family, but everybody coach has their own family. And to make that transition for your family and to do one drop your family, that was huge to me. So I knew he knew what he was doing. I mean, I knew that by reading paper and seeing where he come from. But, again, just that guy willing to do that for his family, I think that was big. And that's somebody we want leading our kids. Well, and I – I think you hit the nail on the head with that. Is it's it's been a natural fit. Absolutely. Uh, it it, and I don't know if it's because he's tall, and so it oh, just he's huge. It, so it just 
it's a natural thing for the defensive coordinator to be huge here. But it, it just it's been seamless. It really has, and I think that's credit to you, Coach Burris, for um, – I, it just it feels like you've been here for ten years, and we've all been coaching together forever. Well, uh, it was an, it was important for me to be here as much as I could this summer, and I didn't I can't think of a time where I missed maybe one day, two days, something like that. Um, but when you when you dive into this, you got to go full force into it um, because you know when they when the kids roll out there, they got to know you and they got to believe in you and they got to know you love them and that you're there to work just like they're there to work and you know we're in this together and so it was very important to me to be a face to be a voice and uh credit to kyle he let me sight unseen pretty much just run the whole outdoor uh running and conditioning and speed training and all that um and let me have it carte blanche and uh they got to know me very fast yeah now talking about you um you have an interesting scheme yes sir uh it's i'm not going to say it's unusual uh but it's unusual and so uh what's uh, what we don't have to go into the nuts and bolts of it but what's the inspiration behind your scheme how did you get to to this to the to the burris defense that's a good question um it is a it is a bit of a frankenstein um so i'm i'm naturally or by trade I would still call myself, I don't know if I'm going to be able to say this anymore now that I've done this a couple of years, but uh, a four-two-five guy, an even front guy, and that's probably the defensive end in me, you know. Yeah. we got to have hands in the ground. we <laughs> got to get after the pass and, you know, drop an eight is soft and, you know, all that. Um, but uh, as, a, as a high school coordinator, uh, you have to address need. And every year you have a new set of needs based on, what 16 17 18 year olds you got and you're having to match that up against the type of things you're going to see on friday night and so based on what we had at richland my last year uh i transitioned out of the 425 into a three high safety look with a stacked box and uh some people that you may have seen on TV that look something like this would be like Iowa State uh, gets a lot of credit um, for running this defense in the Big 12 because they're usually outmanned uh, yeah. when they, you know, face some of these high-flying schools that put up a lot of points. Like Baylor. Yeah. Well, current Baylor, yeah. Sorry. Um, no, I know. <laughs> I know Mr. Letterman. No, I'm, he's a UT fan. So oh, okay. There. Well, he's not a Big 12 champ fan. Whatever. He still talks about 2005. <laughs> well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll bring up 2003. Okay. Oh, don't do that. The Mighty Bears came <laughs> down to Denton. I was at that and, game. And uh, it was, was pretty nasty. I was there. Um, but, no, uh, I mean, they got to face OU. They got to face Oklahoma State. Sure. And, you know, all these teams that are spreading it out, throwing it around, and points, points, points. And they usually hold a pretty good account of themselves. They give these teams problems. And so we started looking at this and some of the uh, metrics that some of the measurables and what are they getting out of this? And uh, so it basically came down to taking away the middle of the field. Okay. in the passing game and in the run game, all right, people get gashed in the middle. All right. People survive on the outside. And so how do we force things outside? How do we keep things from uh, attacking the middle of our field? and we wound up in this so you're going to see tcu run this because gillespie came from tulsa and uh he's running it uh they run it in san diego state but everybody runs their own version of this there's no gary patterson like lock on the 425 and everybody's doing some version of it yeah uh because it's in its infancy right now there uh this last spring and uh when college coaches would come in they found out that i ran the three high they wanted to see what it was they wanted to see what our rules were and they wanted to show me theirs and it was a bunch of uh the brain trust is still going on on how to run this yeah um and i feel like after a season of doing it and uh taking the best things from other teams and then applying whatever needs that we had uh, we were able to adapt it to something that equaled success for us and lowered the amount of big plays on us and uh, reduced the amount of times we got scored on. And ultimately, you know, that's what you're looking for. 
Yeah, a- any defense that reduces the amount of times you're scored <laughs> right. on is, yeah. is usually on the right track. Uh, I'm sure Kyle will appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> keep it up. Uh, now, if you had to describe your defense in one word, what what would what word would you give us? It's the present. Um, it's it's what defense is right now. Uh, yeah. There's like I said, there's a couple people doing it, and maybe it's a little ahead of the curve. You're gonna see it a lot more this next season. Okay, I won't be the only three high that somebody sees on TV in high school football this yeah. next year. Um, we saw it some in seven on seven, just in our little Salina League here and there. Uh, we're ahead of the curve right now. I won't say it's the future because everything is constantly changing. It's always changing. Uh, offenses adapt, defenses adapt. Um, at some point, we'll all be running something that looks what we would call super old school, and then we'll, you know, spread back out. And um, it's a the constant cat and mouse game. But right now, it's the present of high school football. Yeah, and uh, it's a it's a big time situation. Um, uh, we we won't give it an exact down and distance, but just it's it's go time. It's it's do or die. Everything's on the line. Everything's on the line. Every cliche out there. All right, what's your default setting? Are you, are you bringing pressure? Or are you dropping eight back and being soft like what you talked about? So once again, we are predicated on uh, metrics, yeah. and so down and distance would matter. Formation would matter. The 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 history of this team would matter. Um, who my playmakers are to a certain degree, but if it's third and short, I'm bringing heat. Okay, third and seven. Third and seven. Now you're getting tougher. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna be sexy up front, but I'm probably still dropping eight. Four, fourth and three. I'm bringing heat. Okay, okay, all right. There you go. <laughs> I like it. I, I can respect that. Some OCs writing stuff down right now. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm third sure and seven they are. game on the line. Yes. <laughs> He's dropping back, guys. <laughs> Is the 1946 seven straight shutouts string is that in jeopardy this year, and, and Coach? S- yeah, so you go back to the uh, <laughs> to the depths of Pilot Point that's, history. That's seven straight shutouts in 1946. When we, I when I get on my knees at night, <laughs> that's what I'm praying for. <laughs> okay, okay, good Very to know. Good. Now I'm going to ask you a huge question here, and this isn't Pilot Point. This anything? This is back to Bo Burris. Why did you choose to be in this profession? Why, why, what made Bo Burris say, I want to be a coach? And, and kind of when did that decision happen? Man, uh, it, was, it was probably in my subconscious. Uh, and that goes back to family. Um, my dad is, he's my uh, biggest inspiration as a, as a defensive coach and as how a man acts. And uh, he um, coached me one year in high school, and we're lucky we didn't both destroy each other. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, man, just his passion for it, the way the kids and the community loved him for loving what he did and doing it with the heart that he did it with and um, the example of what he was able to show to those kids and me by proxy or the way he showed those kids by proxy, how he treated me. Um, that was my everything. So it was the family business. Um, I have a grandfather that was also, so they were both, uh, college football players and, uh, they were also high school coaches. And so the blood runs deep. Uh, I'm third generation. And, um, if I can be, you know, everybody wants to be as good as their dad someday, uh, that would be phenomenal. Okay, I'm going to tell you a quote, and you tell me what this quote means to you. Okay. Because it is the headline of your father's Twitter account. Remember who you are and whom you represent? Yes. All right. Yeah. What, what does that mean to you? So that's that's probably the family creed. Um, so it's basically the the answer is the same thing like it's two questions in one sentence or it's uh two statements in one sentence and the answer is the same you are who you represent you got to live up to those that you represent live up to uh, the expectations of your family and your responsibilities every day and whatever that is that is who you are what you what you do is who you are it's not about how you feel it's not about um you know, perception or anything else, 
the work you put in and the way you love people, that's who you are and that's who you represent. Are the two of you aligned on defensive philosophy or is he No, he's like not a convinced. No. <laughs> I would love, love, love to bring him out of retirement one day and coach defense with him. Uh, but once again, we might destroy each other. He's like a 52 monster or something. I don't know. Uh, he's he's heavy hands in the line, and uh, he's a good one at it. I'll tell you that. But um, we, we speak the same language, but uh, I think our, our approach might be different. <laughs> Um, scheme wise okay. alright well Coach Burris thank you for your time Coach Peacock thank you for your time I know that you're running a little bit late to a booster club meeting we'll try to get you out of here as quickly as we can they'll be alright I'll be uh, there soon for, uh, for those of you interested you can follow Coach Burris on Twitter at at BB Burris and that is B-U-R-R-U-S-S uh, you normally catch an inspirational quote from the post mor- the, the morning run <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah uh, and do, you, do you have anything else for us? Anything you want to add? Yeah, I want to uh, thank everybody that supports this program, man. Uh, it's like you're getting hugged all the time by somebody, by something they want to give, something they want to do for the kids. And um, Kyle does a great job of reciprocating. You know, the the summer uh, Tuesday parents night, you know, bringing the kids. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter where you're from, who you were, what you looked like, whatever. We got we got your kids for an hour and 15 minutes. Go grocery shopping or go get a meal to eat or whatever. Um, we get the same thing back. Yeah. Our super is like, what do you need? Right, let's get it done. Okay. Coach David, the same way. Uh, these businesses and uh, parents and supporters in the community uh, are ready to lend anything at any time and uh it's powerful and i can't express just in my short amount of time uh how good that feels yeah so uh thank you to the community and uh all these parents that let us uh steal their boys for three four hours a day um (laughs) we get to see them a lot and uh you know it's their most precious asset i know because i have little ones and I appreciate all of them for sure. I don't think Brandy and Kobe are fighting us for time with crew. <laughs> 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 but, uh, no, and, and it is. Pilot Point is a special place. And yeah, I think that's why, uh, you know, some of us have chomped at the bit to come back home. And, and uh, it's hard to leave uh, for sure. And so, uh, absolutely a thank you to that. Coach Peacock, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I'm good. This is your time to extend your booster <laughs> club right here. <laughs> no, but uh, Chance, you've been kind of quiet. Yeah, I, I said much. didn't want to mess up a good show. Okay. All right. Well, uh, you know, we want to thank everybody who listens. Uh, and, you know, we've crossed 7,000 podcast downloads this past week. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. It's about to get hot and heavy on, on Friday nights. And, uh, you know, we'll have it the live broadcast rolling. And so uh, we thank you for the support. And as always, go Bearcats.